Hello and a very warm welcome to the Late Breaking F1 podcast presented by Harry Eid, Sam Sage and me, Ben Hocking, on this non-race weekend Sunday. But we've still got plenty to talk about. Sam, you all right? Oh, well, we know that I'm not all right. I was a bit unwell last night. Um... <laughs> Yes, I ate some food and that food, let's just say, it just didn't agree. We just had an argument at four o'clock in the morning. Uh, but I've now joined my best friends for a better day. So yeah, <laughs> Harry, you all right? I'm well, mate. I I didn't eat any funny food. and Why would it be funny? I wasn't making jokes, mate. Oh, uh, well, okay. I didn't eat any disagreeable food. Thank you. Um, Correct. I'm well, and I'm very happy to be here and I won't be on my phone ever. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, dude. <laughs> Right, food reviews out of the way. Um, we'll actually talk about some F1, um, because even though it's a non-race weekend Sunday, we still have plenty to talk about. We're going to be doing a top five list later on in the show. Stick around to find out what that is. Um, some thoughts on Audi and how it can't accept Sauber's current performances. Ferrari, will they have a post-Monza slump like they had a post-Monaco slump? Our thoughts on that a little bit later on in the show. But we're going to start with Red Bull, because... The season started very well for Red Bull, but it hasn't been going there all oh, all their own way recently. Um, Max Verstappen wasn't very happy at the Italian Grand Prix weekend. He was speaking to the official F1 website after, and he said, it's really bad at the moment. Before Baku, we have a lot of work to do to basically change the whole car. Sam, that's never usually a good sign. It's just absolutely mind-blowing to me that they're at this point where the car is suddenly that bad that the whole thing needs to be changed. Like less than four months ago, you were winning almost every race one, two at this point, at least Max Verstappen was having a good old time running away with some race victories. And yet now every single part, I know he's obviously over exaggerating and much like myself, I love a good over exaggeration, but come on, mate. It was incredible four months ago, and now you're, what, a few tenths behind at most? It surely does need to be a bit of a reverse on some upgrades that haven't gone to plan. Have a little rethink about the direction you're going in, and maybe just accept, you know what, we've been caught at the end of a new development cycle, which is going to end next year. Do we want to put all of our focus into the likes of 2026 anyway? Just accept we had a good run. We got three titles out of this. Do we now want to move forward and crack on elsewhere because I, I kind of think that they're maybe putting too many eggs into one basket and Max Verstappen is potentially not looking at the bigger picture which we know in the seasons he does he likes to race race by race he doesn't look at it like I've mentioned previously how Prost would look at it where Verstappen will go if I get third every single Grand Prix with one second place actually I'm going to win the title anyway he's like nah nah mate wings are I'm done if I don't win I don't want to know so I think that's how he's reviewing it. And he expects the car to be ready to go as soon as possible. Actually, I think if someone were to sit him down and go, you know what, Max, we ain't got the, we ain't got the money now because of the cost cap. We ain't got the development time. We're going to prepare for 2026. And the next 15 months is going to be a little bit rubbish. But boom, 2026, you're winning another two or three titles. To me, that seems like a good deal. But I'm just shocked. I'm shocked that they have fallen for, at such a pace from the very, very, it's so far from the top. Look how good they were last year. One person won who wasn't in that car across a 20, what was it, ended up being a 22 race calendar, 21 race calendar, which is absolutely mind blowing in terms of statistics. And yet um, now they can barely get into the, to the top three steps. It's absolutely baffling how they've fallen. Harry, how do you fix a car that needs everything fixing? <laughs> that's a very profound question um oh i've i've seen a couple of comments and look there's i don't buy into the hype that as soon as adrian newey said he was leaving red bull they've started being bad that's not true and it doesn't correlate whatsoever however he's not allowed to they've basically banned him from working on this car car now he's not really doing much anymore he's sort of just sat in the corner twiddling his thumbs and they're trying to upgrade and develop and understand a car that he that he designed and he's a genius but maybe he's like a mad genius and no one understands his work because he's just him um i think that all could handwritten notes isn't it <laughs> yeah ben it could be like you write it like you've written all the notes and no one knows what he said <laughs> if i die this podcast is in trouble because my <laughs> yeah. handover I just you can't you won't be able to understand a word of it for the love of god put it all in a google sheet um <laughs> what, what is the podcast called i can't <laughs> yeah. find the game it's but, written back like begins with an l i think <laughs> Um, so I, there could well be a, an element of that to it. Um, the Red Bull are trying to trying to fix a car that 
that their chief, you know, the chief designer of uh, isn't allowed to do anything towards it anymore. Um, I don't, I'm with Sam, I don't buy the fact that, I know for Verstappen this seems like a, a real fall in performance, and it is, it's, it's quite a big chunk down, but he's, as Sam says, he was winning not that long ago, um, and I don't know, it just does feel like maybe they need to just rewind a bit on some upgrades they've brought along and see and see where that takes them because it's clear something's not working with how they've they've developed that car. They brought upgrades forward um, from like three three races early or something, wasn't they? Brought them along. I would suggest either they they've not worked or they've just not understood them yet because they did bring them forward three races early. Uh, yeah, it's not it's not the end of the world. I don't think for Red Bull. I think it's just still. I think it's still fixable. I don't think it's an unfixable, terrible, terrible car. It's not because it was winning quite a lot and quite comfortably not very, very not very long ago. So, um, I I wouldn't I would still would not count them out, um, Red Bull because I think this could easily be fixable and turn it around. And even when the car isn't performing at its optimum, you you still have Max Verstappen in your locker who who. I think the last couple of wins he he got were wins he maybe didn't deserve in terms of the car, uh, and he he pulled them out himself. So, yeah, it's not it's it's not disaster. I know it might seem like disaster sta- disaster stations for them, but I don't think it is. Yeah, um, like you, Sam, I'm not overly concerned by Verstappen's comments specifically because if there's one thing F1 drivers like to be, it's hyperbolic. Like that, they will exaggerate. Um, it, not everything needs changing on the car. Um, it's still slightly worrying, but the comments themselves, I, I'm more looking at on track as to the concerns rather than Verstappen's comments off track. Um, and you have to remember everything is relative and everything you need to put into perspective. So Verstappen is coming off one of the greatest runs by a driver and a team in history. Like it's, it's right up there. If you look at Imola 2022, through to China of this year, that's 46 races. Verstappen won 37 of them. Like he went through such an historic run last season and 2022 that anything in comparison to that is going to seem awful. Um, And I guess to your point, Harry, about how in the middle of this season, Verstappen was making the difference in these races where it was closer. I feel like Verstappen just wants to get back to that. Obviously, he's not going to turn down if they turn up next weekend and they're as dominant as they were at the beginning of the year. But more realistically, if that team can get back to the point of um, you know Spain, where Verstappen won by two seconds, or Imola, where he won by just under one second, or Canada is another good example, where it felt like Verstappen made the difference that day. I think if Red Bull can just get back to that point, Verstappen will feel confident that if he's if he's given an equal car or a, or a very close to equal car, he'll back himself to be the the guy that can deliver. He has got that buffer, so it's not like they need to get back to where they were at the beginning of this year, but that they do need to get far closer to McLaren than they were at, at Monza and at Zandvoort as well. I feel like maybe the most concerning part, and again, you have to take comments with a pinch of salt, is do they understand what the issue is? It always, that's always the question, isn't it? When a team is struggling, like, do they understand the issue? Is it multiple issues or is it one issue that they just can't quite diagnose? They do keep experimenting with the floor on Perez and Verstappen's cars. It does feel like Baku, Singapore, these next two races, they really need to, I don't know, just, get themselves to a position where they know where they're going for the rest of this season. Cause if they're still lost by the end of Singapore, that would be worrying from, from my perspective. Um, before we move on, Harry, you made the point about Adrian Newey, which I think is fair to bring up at this point, because obviously it was around what, six months ago, just over now where he made the decision that he was going to leave Red Bull. It was about April time, wasn't Miami it? Miami weekend. Right. Yeah. So yeah, April, May time that it came out now. And I do wonder if, we have just hit the point where he's future proofing. Cause obviously these designers don't work to the same point that the, dr- the drivers are at, right? They're, he's not making upgrades for Miami as they're in Miami. He'll be making upgrades for Singapore as we're in Miami. They need to work four or five months ahead to make sure the development cycle is in place. And I do wonder if we have over the last month or so reached the point where they've gone, 
ah, Adrian's magic has rung out and now we need to make our own. And he sat there just looking at them in the corner of the room like <laughs> like a mad genius. Sabotage. Laughing at them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Now, I, now you see what I do for you. Um, it does feel like we have reached that kind of, the latency period has kicked in and now we're back to kind of where Adrian knew he would have been working in the future, probably because he's just always there. Is that brilliant? He's probably always six months in the future anyway. He knows what's coming at all points. Um which is fantastic. But I do think that actually it shows you just how powerful him and his team are. And if it is down to that, how much they might struggle moving forward. They might never recover the gap. And that might be where Max Verstappen is starting to get a little bit anxious, worried about what the uh, the journey moving forward looks like. Although Adrian Yu is not the only man that can make a fast car. I mean, no doubt there are members of that Red Bull team that would just desperately right now want to turn to Adrian Newey just to say, can you have a look? Please. We've, we've all had a look. We can't <laughs> spot what's wrong. Would you mind taking a look for us? And they can't. They can't at the moment. Um, on the other side of the garage, so Sergio Perez had some comments after the Italian Grand Prix as obviously both Red Bull struggle to compete with the top couple of teams. Um, he said, I really feel like I'm in the same boat as I've been in the last 10 races, but now all of a sudden Max has come to similar issues. So there's a little bit of confusion there, but it's clear in the data where the problem is. Harry, do you buy that this is Verstappen coming back to the issues that Perez has always had, or is this Perez using this as an opportunity to prove himself? Uh, it's a good try, Sergio. <laughs> my guy <laughs> I, I appreciate the effort on this one he spotted an opportunity and he's gone for it and I, I respect it I respect the hustle um, but come on <laughs> that's not why would if they were the same issues Max Verstappen does in the, okay if they're the same issues that Perez has had the whole time and Verstappen's been driving around them why now would he not be able to drive around these issues and is having the same problem I don't the logic doesn't work I don't buy it Sergio I'm sorry um, it, it suddenly Verstappen has, hasn't been able to get around these issues. It's, it's not a thing. So I respect I respect the hustle. As I say, it was worth it was worth a go. But I, I just don't believe you on that one, son. Before we turn to Sam, I'd like uh -oh. everyone listening to have a guess what you think Sam's opinion on this is. <laughs> Pause it now and, and tweet us. <laughs> if you're wrong, I will know it's your first episode. Sam, um, what do you think of this? You know the phrase, uh, grasping at straws? Um, Does that apply here, do you think? I, I, I think so. It's like someone said, here, Sergio, try and grab these straws. And actually, they're saying that from Australia while he's stood in Monza, and there are no straws. They've just said there's some straws. And he's there, please, give me the straw. They don't exist, Sergio. The straws don't exist. You've made them up. They're in your mind. It's like Shutter Island. At the end of the movie, you'll realise you were the one that was wrong. There were no straws. Sorry if that's a spoiler to anyone. That's a direct spoiler of the movie. Do you know what, mate? I'm not sure that's an actual spoiler. <laughs> no, fine. Watch it see. <laughs> so coded. Um, I'm not sure they're going to work out that one out. <laughs> Leonardo DiCaprio with his straws. That's on the back of the box. We <laughs> can get on DVD. I think we've um, hit the maximum quota of the word straws being said. <laughs> like, we, we can't do any more. That's the last straw. Um, oh, basically, God. Sergio... These issues that Max has been experiencing have been slowly increasing, but they kind of hit the forefront in Zangvor. The difference is that Zangvor, Max Verstappen was able to finish second place, my guy. He was still only behind Lando Norris at that point. Monza exacerbated the issue. And very much so because minute differences at Monza can make for a very large difference come the end of the Grand Prix. It was very, very small gaps between the top six. It was only Red Bull that, of course, started to back up. What I think is very, very interesting is while Max Verstappen, I think, still drove a really strong Grand Prix, he still beat George Russell, which I think Russell probably should have got Verstappen with how well the cars maybe were performing differently. Sergio was still a pit stop behind his teammate almost at this point. And it tells you that actually while Max Verstappen, yes, is starting to really struggle with how the car is just developing and changing, Sergio Perez, the gap is still almost identical to what it has been at every other Grand Prix. The car is getting worse, but the gap between them isn't getting closer. It just exacerbates the gap between these top eight drivers, the top four cars, and the rest of the grid. P9 is so far away that someone like Red Bull can afford to have this fall off in pace where they are three, four, five tenths slower than the McLarens, the Ferraris, the Mercedes at this point. And they are still so comfortably sat in seventh and eighth. Well, in that case, it was sixth and eighth, of course. So I think that while Sergio is 
desperately looking for any good PR. You know, under this brick? Is it in the back of the car? You know, where can I find any? It's not there, mate, because it doesn't exist. You are manipulating a second circumstances to try and make yourself look better, which again, as Harry said, I respect the hustle, my guy. I get it. But it ain't true. The Stappen is still schooling your ass and you need to make sure that you pick up those performances because you're still so far behind. If there is any chance that anything good happens in a race moving forward, the Stappen will be there to take advantage. Sergio might not still. If the car's going to be that slow, you still need to be within four or five seconds of your teammate, not, not on a pit stop. Yeah, it doesn't quite line up, I'm afraid, Sergio. Um, and, and that's based on, if you want any evidence of that, it's just look at last year because what's happened to Sergio Perez this year is the same as last year. Like there's, there's no difference. We both, in both instances, he starts the year quite well and then we come to the European season and Verstappen has a very comfortable lead on his teammate. It's exactly the same this year. Uh, and the problem is, I guess, with Verstappen, yeah, he still he still somewhat made it work, even when the car hasn't been brilliant. Perez was, as he was last season, often getting knocked out either in Q1, Q2, or only just scraping it through to Q3, to the point where we very rarely could make an accurate race pace comparison because he was he was essentially putting himself out of the running on Saturday. Um, so I I don't really think there's much truth. I, again, I, fair play. You might as well give it a go. But I, I don't think there's a lot of truth in what he's saying here. Right, we'll take our first break on this episode. On the other side, we're talking about Ferrari. Welcome back, everyone. Before we move on to Ferrari, a quick live show announcement. Harry, how, how many tickets have we got left? Um, there's not, th- there's not three. There's no. not, there's not two. No, there's not even one. None. We got, we got no tickets. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 it's not a reference. <laughs> no, we're correct. We have no tickets from any. That's for the gumba. We have sold out for our Austin live show. Thank you to everyone who's bought tickets. We are incredibly excited to see you on the Thursday before that Grand Prix. Um, Obviously, the second straight year that we've come to Austin, the second straight year we've had a sellout show. So we are massively appreciative of all of you that plan to come along. Uh, We will let you know if any tickets become available, of course. But for now, at least, completely sold out. Thank you very much indeed. Ferrari now, let's move on to them because Charles Leclerc had some comments after the Italian Grand Prix, uh, a Grand Prix which went pretty well for Charles Leclerc, you'd have to say all in all. He he won the thing. Um, But he (laughs) is being a little bit cautious um, and understandably so. He said, we shouldn't rely on the race we have just done. As a team, it's really important for us that once we come back at the factory tomorrow, we reset from everything that, that has happened during the weekend. We learn from it and we try to analyze everything, but we should leave emotions aside and reset as a team and go again in Baku. Monza is a very specific track. We've been very strong this weekend, but Baku will be maybe be very different and Singapore again, very different. So we've got to reset. Um, Harry, we've seen... Leclerc win two races this year, one at the slowest track on the calendar, one at the fastest track on the calendar. We saw quite a slump post Monaco. How do we not see a slump post Monza? Uh, uh, it's it's going to happen because they've only, I'm telling you now, they've only done upgrades for Monza and Monaco and that's it. They've got two specific cars for the year, the Monaco Ferrari and the Monza Ferrari. And this is <laughs> this is where they uh... and then a bus that they use for everything else. <laughs> um, I d- I don't know I d- I don't know how they ensure because it d- I don't have any faith based on what I've seen so far this year. Monza is less specific and special than Monaco in the uh, so that should give them some hope. And Baku got a long straight on it, got a big Ooh, old straight. That's um, what that is. Yeah, so. It's quite high speed still. I know it's a street circuit, so different, but high speed and heavy braking zones, which is actually very similar to Monza. Ferrari might still fancy their chances here, uh, you know, uh, coming up to Baku. So um, that will give them some hope. Singapore, I guess, is another street circuit, but kind of very different to Monaco. So they may be good there, they may be not. But Singapore is like a weird anomaly on the calendar where even the most dominant car is terrible there, as we saw last year with Red Bull and have seen before with Mercedes. It's like... All rules go out the window at Singapore for some weird reason. Um, so yeah, they they can fancy their chances, but I, honestly, I, I've got no faith. 
<laughs> I've got zero faith in them being able to convert this into anything competitive for the next race. But to be honest, that kind of speaks to how this year has gone because we've seen such a um, a variation of form between teams in between each different race, which is excellent to watch because we come to a race weekend. We even get past qualifying where you're like, well, we know the order now. And then Charles Leclerc wins Monza, which to be honest, I don't think any, any of us saw happening, so, well, apart from Sam. Um, <laughs> apart from Sam. But, yeah, so that that's great to watch. I just think it's it's hard to predict who's gonna who's going to be strong there. I'd say Ferrari Ferrari tend to be good around Baku, Leclerc especially. He loves a loves a quality lap around there. Um so he, when he's not feeling very stupid, of course. When he's not feeling stupid. Um but you know, he's got a few poles a few poles in uh, in Baku before, so they'll they'll fancy their chances, but honestly, I've got little, little faith in them. What do you think, Sam? Yeah, I'm I'm on that plane with Harry, flying towards the destination of little faith because it, thank you. Um, it does feel like a tall order for Ferrari, and what there is a de- difference between their wing in Monaco and their wing in Monza. In Monaco, it feels like they were purpose built to dominate that racetrack it felt like they turned up they knew their objective the car knew what it needed to do the clerk knew what he needed to do and they delivered and it was a really momentous victory great for him great for the team and it all went so smoothly right everything worked as it needed to and he was unstoppable unlike monza where i don't think they were ever fastest I don't think in qualifying they ever really were close to coming to pole position. In the race, they never really had the fastest car. And I actually think it was, I can't believe I'm saying this, groundbreaking strategy that was applied to ensure that Charles Leclerc was actually involved in the race win at the end of the Grand Prix. And if it was a couple of laps longer, I don't think he's winning anyway. I really do think it is cut, cutting your teeth on, on nothing kind of stuff to make sure that you won that Grand Prix. So what worries me leaving Monza is... Unlike in Monaco, where they had the car to dominate and maybe they could lean on these characteristics that make sure they were better than their competitors. I don't think they have that here. I do think they're slower than uh, the, the McLaren skill. I do think that the Red Bulls will probably bounce back as, again, straight line, ultimate straight line speed clearly wasn't their strength here. I think they're going to improve in the like, especially in Singapore, I think. I do think this is worrying for Ferrari. And I'm surprised that Leclerc has come out and said, we need to make sure we don't have another slump. My guy, you weren't high up to have a slump back down. You're still trying to climb. I just, I'm really quite shocked that he's come out and said this and not just, uh, hey, we've still got a long way to go. The brilliant strategy put us in a great place to win, but there's a lot of development to happen. McLaren are still the, the, the top dogs. That would have felt more sensible to me. I, I'm surprised he's gone down this level. The car is definitely nowhere near being the best. It's a good car. It's not a great car. Do you think um, Ferrari have anyone uh, from Azerbaijan in their team so they can claim it as a home race? Because that's the oh, only is that way. how they're doing it now. That's the only way they win, right? Well, Azerbaijan is in Europe, as we all know, so <laughs> that counts as a home race, right? Yeah, cheers, Bernie. Thank you, Bernie. Good <laughs> geography. I know it was a joke, but being called Bernie is um, is a bit triggering. Like <laughs> Bernie, Bernie Ecclestone is not a comparison anyone ever wants. Um, I, I think he's right to be cautious. I think he is absolutely right to be cautious. It's completely valid because we have had these two races where Ferrari have been very good and they are at the opposite ends of the spectrum. And Monaco was maybe a bit misleading. There's a chance Monza is misleading as well. Um, I am glad that Leclerc has gone with this strategy out of Monza rather than his original strategy out around Monaco time, which was we're going to have upgrades and they're going to be the best that have ever been seen. And we're going to win the title by a million points. <laughs> I'm paraphrasing a little bit, but they were quite confident at that time. Um, and I think they are being a bit more measured here. Let's not forget that obviously if you take Monza out of the equation and you look at the two races before that, I think we're all agreed. Charles Leclerc did a sensational job at both Spa and Zandvoort. Zanvoort, he was still 25 seconds off the lead. Spa, he was still eight seconds off the lead. And that's not down to his performance. That's just there were better cars out there than the Ferrari on those days. So if we get back to that, then yes, he's right to be cautious. I am intrigued to see how the upgrades work at Baku because, as you say, there is a very long straight at Baku. But it's it's not the be-all and end-all at Baku. You, you still do need a balanced car to get you through that middle sector. So I, I'm intrigued to see how that works. Sam, is either championship in play at the moment, do you think? I think the drivers has come and gone. 
I mean, the fact that we're all discussing how Piastri is technically still, you know, in the championship hunt is unlikely to ever really get there unless... I think someone did the maths on one of our YouTube videos that if the Stappen were to finish seventh every single race and Piastri were to win every single race and Norris doesn't come second for some of the races, then he will win it by like four points or something like that. I'm like, yeah, okay, cool. So realistically, not happening. So Leclerc in a car that isn't the fastest car right now and hasn't shown dominance really at a single racetrack other than Monaco, which we know they sold their soul to achieve. I just can't see Leclerc taking the driver's title, which is a shame because he's having a banger of a season. But constructors, on the other hand, that is weirdly not out the window yet. I think that is actually achievable. If these upgrades work, if Sykes just, who's having, again, a good season, could just close up to the Claire a little bit and they can maybe pick up a couple of, I don't know, one threes, two threes, two fours more regularly and they start outscoring one of the McLarens quite regularly. They're comfortably beating Perez already. I don't think it's impossible for them to close that gap. It's only a few races and you can pick up so many points each Grand Prix with both drivers comfortably inside that top five. It's not, it's not impossible. We've seen bigger gaps closed in Formula One before than this, what, 60-odd point gap that's sitting there between Ferrari and between Red Bull right now. What do you think, Harry? Either championship still available for Ferrari? Uh, constructors, yes, potentially. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm going to say I'm a drive. Drivers would have to be some real divine in- intervention. Uh, for He's their... God declare. He is, to oh. be fair. He could call on the big man upstairs. Um, he is the big he man. He is the big man. Oh, right, sorry, yeah, of course. <laughs> Get the peck in order, sort it like no one's higher than Leclerc. God Leclerc, underneath God. Actual God. And uh, yeah, good. I'm glad we're gonna have that work. Sorry yeah. to all faith. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think we've ever done an apology for all faith. Well, I mean it's good to cover them all, all yeah, bases. Yeah, cover all bases, man. New target audience <laughs> apologies. We've offended any of you. Sorry. Um <laughs> But yeah, I think the drivers is probably out of the question. But constructors, if they can continue to be like they were a Monza. Not not out the question. They, the, I think McLaren are their main issue on that one because they've they're very consistent at the moment. Uh, Red Bull they could they might be able to have, but they got a, they got a job trying to beat McLaren at the same time. So constructors are, is their most realistic realistic option, but um, it's going to be a tough ask. Yeah, it will. And I think Baku in, by the end of Singapore again. This this double header feels important for Ferrari because. If coming out of Singapore, their upgrades have performed slightly better than expected and maybe one of the other two teams have had a, a DNF, then then suddenly it might be game on. But equally, we might know by the end of Singapore that actually it's not going to happen for them this year. Um, you know, Sainz and Leclerc, despite the fact that we, you know, give Leclerc a lot of credit and rightly so, Sainz is still there. Sainz is still picking up the pieces. He's still coming home with solid results. So he needs to keep that up. And if this Verstappen versus Norris, maybe versus Piastri storyline keeps unfolding and there is a driver's championship fight, Ferrari could be the team best positioned to take advantage of that. Like if if they start taking unnecessary points away from one another and we do have Norris and Verstappen go side by side like they did in Austria and we're seeing incidents maybe similar to what we had with Verstappen and Hamilton in 2021, then suddenly Ferrari coming home with third and fourth place finishes or second and third place finishes, they might be well positioned. So I think that's what Ferrari need to, that Ferrari need to be a word that they don't really understand. Ferrari need to be perfect, right? Ferrari just need to be the team that gets the strategy calls, right? They capitalize on errors from other teams and they're the ones picking up the pieces from others, not doing their jobs. If they can play that role perfectly, then maybe it's on. Drivers, you're right, probably not. It's because even though Leclerc has been exceptional, I think the last three or four races, if we look at the last four races, he's still not secured the most points in that time frame. He scored more than Verstappen. He scored 19 more than Verstappen in the last four races, but that's not enough. And that's not even including the McLaren guys. He's three points behind Norris in the last four races, and he's six points behind Piastri. So realistically it would need to be again the upgrades would have to be so much better than even monza showed that they were for that to become even close to being a reality realistically they need to leave singapore being the top scoring team right that oh, three, yeah, yeah. three would be going the right way they've got to outscore everyone in those two races combined i i would agree with that 
Let's take our second break on this episode. On the other side, we're going to be chatting through Audi. Welcome back, everyone. Um, we've now got a topic on Audi um, and what is currently Sauber, that green toaster. Uh, Mattia Bonotto started work at Sauber slash Audi in August. Uh, I think he attended his first race at the Italian Grand Prix. He had some comments about the team and I guess the future team. We cannot afford it when he's talking about current performances. This is the team that has to become, in the future, a winning team. And the only way to do that is to start moving up, progressing. We need to train our muscles for the future. So, yes, I think we certainly need to improve. That's important for ourselves. That's important for the team. It's important for the brand, for our partners. And we cannot accept the current position. Sam, a lot is is made of 2026 and onwards when it comes to this future Audi team. And realistically, they're not going to be bringing home any silverware this season or next season. But what do you make of Bonotto's comments that they at least need to show improvement in that time frame so that they're ready when 2026 rolls around? Well, I can't believe I'm saying this, but I 100% agree with Mattia Bonotto. I think he's exactly right. And I imagine that's partially why he's been given the, the role is his ambition again, bizarre, and the way he is trying to carve a route forward for them to be wholly successful. You've got to remember his background. He is being in and around successful teams of drivers for nigh on 25 years at this point. He has seen the very highs of Formula 1, and he does know what it takes, despite his, his failings in the later Ferrari years that he had, of course, when they were up against Mercedes and the like. But that Audi, you know, well, what is to become Audi, the Sauber team, if their F1 world title is the top of Everest, they're starting down the Mariana Trench. You know, they are so far gone. They need to get above sea level first before they can even start being competitive. So you don't want to hand off this partnership to an absolute Goliath that is Audi in terms of car manufacturing, sporting ambition, money, technological improvement. You've all sprung dirt technique. You know, they've got it all. They're in a blur song. They've got everything. I was so- just about to say, all right, blur. <laughs> <laughs> so they can't be starting this far down. And he is so right to sit there and go, we, the work can't start in 2026 or we hope we turn up with a car that's decent. They need to get the foundations in place where team members have got practice, the the, the drills are well-oiled and you know, pit stops aren't going to be a problem. And actually they're competitive with at least the midfield runners. They cannot be walking around. Well, it feels like walking with air pace, a good second uh, slower than the rest of their competitors at this point with only, what, 15 months to go before Audi entered this sport. It's not a good omen. There's too much work to do if this is how it is at the end of next season. He is right. They need to get their elbows out, start getting to work and making some changes because I'm not expecting them to start scoring points, but even be fighting with the likes of where Williams are now, where RB are now. At least you're kind of finishing on the odd occasion. 11th, 12th, 13th. You're there if there's a bad day for someone else. There might be a point available. Not, oh, Bottas was good. Wasn't he until halfway through the race and then you pit him and now he was 19th. That can't happen constantly. So, but also he's 100% correct. They need to see changes before Audi become the actual name on that team. Do you understand Bonotto's point here, Harry? I do, because you, they cannot have a toaster until Audi turn up. They need to at least upgrade to a grill. Not maybe, legal, actually. Well, maybe, maybe, a, maybe an oven. At least, um, someone will do a bit more cooking. Uh, Ooh, good analogy, <laughs> love you. that. Um, but yeah, they, they cannot. Audi can. I know Audi already there in the background. That's why Bernardo has been brought on board. Um, but they cannot. Uh, they cannot just turn up as Audi after two years of being a terrible Sauber kick steak bake, because it's going to be a disaster. They have to at least be starting to be on the grid and and. It's not even like they need to be, you know, I'm not even saying be like point scorers. They need to just be at least in it because they're not even anywhere near it at the moment. They're terrible. And it's quite a shocking decline because since Alfa Romeo, Alfa Romeo would, were never bringing any technical expo- expertise to Sauber. They were just a sticker on that car. So it's quite shocking how badly this year has gone because I don't think they've lost anything in terms of uh, performance in the front, or money or resource to be, only from like a sponsorship point of view. Um, so yeah, this has been this year has been bad. They need twenty twenty five to uh, be a, 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 an improvement, and maybe it is because they are just counting everything into twenty twenty six, which is fair. It's a good idea, but they are truly sacrificing everything <laughs> at that point, which is is going to have an, an adverse effect. Even even from just like a um, you know. Uh, motivational point of view for the everyone that works in the team like two years or a year or so being absolutely terrible 
it's going to it's going to people might leave etc so you can't afford to be doing that they need to be a, a, aiming towards aiming towards some sort of improvement next year to then hit 2026 running properly but yeah i think it's a sensible comment from Matia. um as we said before he he has team, he's, his failings as a team principal are, are well known but he's he's not an idiot he's actually a very clever man and has worked for ferrari winning multiple championships so I know he's not team principal, he's more CEO type role, which maybe this will suit him better. Um, but he's he's 100% right on this occasion. Yeah, three for three, Bonotto. You are 100% correct. Um, people might be expecting something of a magical turnaround in 2026. It very rarely happens that way. Even if we look at some instances where you think a team has suddenly popped up overnight to be this juggernaut in the sport, it's very rarely that it has been overnight. Like if you look at, look at McLaren now, like they have progressed a lot, but even they were third in 2020. They won a race in 2021. Like there were the foundations being built. If you look at Mercedes, when they dominated the start of the hybrid era, 2013 was a a fairly encouraging year for them in the last year, like last year of that set of regulations, like they, they had three race wins that year and they had eight pole positions. They, I think they were the second best qualifying team after Red Bull that year. So again, that didn't quite pop up overnight. And then the one that probably people will go straight to is Braun because, you know, they were like ninth or something in 2008 and then they won it in 2009. But even that was very specifically one innovative technological like upheaval right like that they managed to i don't want to say they got lucky because it was it was skill what they did but they had to get one thing absolutely right to turn that around and i don't think the same thing will happen with with audi they they do need to at least whether it's via people whether it's via processes you talk about pit stops and getting those better like all of these things can be worked on now so they can hit the ground running in in 2026 And you're right, 2024 has been nothing short of an embarrassment for this team so far because it's one thing being pointless, and if they stay pointless, it would be their first year without scoring since 2014. But to do it in a cost cap era, that's like even worse, right? That's more of an embarrassment where everyone is not quite on an even playing field, but it's certainly closer than it used to be. And to your point, Harry, when Alfa Romeo were there, it's not like they had a groundbreaking couple of years right but they did at least hit double figures in terms of points in five of the last six seasons so it is still quite a downgrade on where they were remember the first year of Alfa Romeo when it was Raikkonen and and Giovinazzi of course Raikkonen is apparently going back to the team now if you believe the Italian Grand Prix Um, they had had like 55 points or something that year like it was encouraging enough so yeah they, they do need to improve before Audi get in Bonotto also had some comments on the lineup because whilst we know Hulkenberg is going there next year, we still don't know what's happening with the other seat. Um, He said, it's definitely something that we need to judge. Are we going for experience or something else? This is a project which is looking to a long-term objective. So the question is, what's the best for us now to the final goal? Is it having short-term experience and then moving to something different? We need to decide. And today, I think we're not in the position to answer. Um, He went through a couple of those on the shortlist. He said, Teo, Teo Bullshit, is our reserve driver today. Ben's going to explode. (laughs) He can see him. (laughs) So somehow he's already part of the family and no doubt that he's on our list. Gabriel, Gabriel Bortoletto, who's currently in F2, is doing very well today in F2. I think he is shown to be a great talent and certainly we are looking to what he's doing as we are looking to many others. I don't see these are the only names on which we are focusing our attention. There are many names in the list with great potential, great expertise, great experience. Um, Sam, you for experience, which direction do they go? Has he forgotten that they already have half a driver lying up that covers the experience? Does he know? Does he know Hulkenberg exists? Hello, Hulk. Make yourself known, mate. Um, yeah, I mean, the guy's got driver. a lot of races under his belt. Been quite a few teams, fielding a lot. Been around for at least what twelve years now? 11, 11 12 years. Been a while. Experience is the first thing you tick off with Hulkenberg, really, at this point. Done. Big green tick. Um, they like that as well because they're green. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. don't know why you keep saying this whole do we have, you know, youth versus experience thing. You've got that. If you want double experience, I get it. 
You have another guy on your team already who is very experienced, multiple race wings, multiple pole positions, works alongside statistically the greatest F1 driver of all time, uh, worked for the greatest team statistically of all time. You know, that guy ticks a lot of boxes in Valtteri Bottas as well. So you currently have experience wrapped up in a lovely little experiential package that sits there on your desk. You have that covered. You've got that right now. Bottas, you can have, I'll have another one-year deal. He'll hate it, but he'll take it. If you now is the time to nurture and build a driver that could become your Kimi Antonelli, your Lando Norris, your Oscar Piastri, your Lewis Hamilton of old now. You know, now is the birth of what could be this new sporting empire within Formula One. If you're going to give someone time to be a rookie, to develop, to, to grow into the sport, to make mistakes where realistically it don't bloody matter. Who cares if if poor shares crash six times in that? kicks Alba at the back of the grid next year but actually when he is finishing he's right there up alongside Hulkenberg every single race that's great that's a great start to his career he's pushing forward don't do that your first year as Audi when you think right we've got through the the moss that is but the mold of green that is back there as Sauber we're, we're out of that we're clean now with bang, the dirt is gone, and we're Audi, and we're here to perform. Barry Scott, hello, <laughs> hello, Barry, Scott. you're right. That's a performance on the on the show. Makes an appearance. Is he a driver? I didn't know that. <laughs> well, he's got experience in that field as well. He, does. he cleans the dirt away. Um, <laughs> nonetheless, I just think they are silly to not do a classic. What what half struggled to achieve for so many years? Don't make the same mistake. You can have both at the same time, and they have the option to do so. I think a poor share Hulkenberg lineup for next year would be, I think it's quite tasty. I would maybe even call that a big tasty because. Oh, I like a big tasty. It's back as well at the moment, mate. Is it's it? With, oh, yeah, I'll yeah. go to McDonald's later. <laughs> maybe in a couple of weeks' time when we meet up, we'll go get one. <laughs> okay. Little treat for the team. Um, not for you, Kirsty, you're vegetarian. Um, anyway, <laughs> I just think, think about it. You, you've got both availabilities. Hulkenberg exists. Think about it. Why have you banned our producer from McDonald's? They have vegetarian things there. Oh, she can have it. It's not a bit tasty. <laughs> <laughs> he so slaps it out of her hand. No. <laughs> no, I control your morals. <laughs> Did you read the contract? <laughs> oh, this is this is dismissal level. <laughs> right. Um, so Porsche and Hulkenberg might be a, a good line. That's an interesting point of view. Harry, what, what have you got to say? Um... Yeah, we were giving some good compliments to Matteo Bonotto just now, and um, I'd like to re- just say <laughs> rescind them all. <laughs> no, I'm not rescinding them because they, they, I maintain that co- that compliment. Just gonna uh, compliment that with this is a stupid thing to say, Matteo. Very good. <laughs> what? Duality of man. <laughs> he is the duality of man. <laughs> I am also clever and stupid at the same time. Um, it also worries me that he is really who's Matteo's really good mate. Mate, is there a joke here? Is this a real thing? No, an actual uh, serious question. We've seen oh, them together. They drive. You're doing a play on his words. No, no, no. no. Like the Kimster. No, it's no not Kimster. Ha- oh, you're talking about watching House. Um, the Gunter what? Steiner. Gunter Steiner. Yeah. Oh, and okay. Sam's yeah. already mentioned House and their inability to have experience and youth at the same time. Do you think Matthias has been talking to Gunther? Even Italian Ooh. countryside, taking <laughs> a Fiat Five Hundred. Yeah. Going. What should I do? And 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 Gunther's like, well, you could only have experience and experience or youth and youth. So anyway, it was it's like, oh, okay, yeah, that oh, okay, that makes sense. <laughs> Those are the rules. <laughs> um, yeah, a little bit worrying that they're, they're struggling with this concept, as you say, Sam. They got big old experience already signed up. Nico's like, I am, I'm here next year. Guys. I am old. <laughs> I'm old and I'm here. <laughs> um, I like you say, I can see them signing Bottas for a one a one year deal, um, which he will get like. PTSD from I'm sure but <laughs> poor guy poor, poor guy <laughs> um but it, it it might be worth it might be worth keeping there for for the next year just to evaluate whether they want to keep him for thing is if they keep him for one more year I don't think they keep him for Audi so for Bottas it's almost like do I just want one more year in F1 I don't know um I think the sensible option is to as you say put in a a younger or a, a rookie driver because give you're going to give them a year um to learn, learn their trade. Teo Porcher, as Ben, I'm sure will make a point, has been sat on the sidelines as a, <laughs> a I don't know, I'm, I'm on the fence. <laughs> as a reserve <laughs> young driver for about 20 years now. He actually isn't young anymore. He's been sat there so long. <laughs> you me now. <laughs> um, but they have that, 
they have that ready to go and it, it they could put him in a car for, for next year and I'm not saying he could be terrible because it, it just gives him a chance to evaluate whether he would be the right choice to move into the 2026 uh, Audi era with with uh, with Hulkenberg, but next year would seem like a prime opportunity to give that a little test, give them a little whirl. Because as we've already spoken about, yeah, they need to improve, but they're not going to improve to like anything meaningful next year. It's more of a more of a, te- a testing year for them. So um, that would make sense. Having a lineup with experience and youth, it's good. Actually, a good thing. Look at. Uh, Mercedes. I know George Russell isn't the oldest guy on the grid, but he's got experience, and they're putting youth next to him. <laughs> yeah, Ben's making hand gestures there because it works. Um, I think this. Yeah, that, stop questioning it. Experience and youth at the same time, please. I wouldn't be mad if they put Bottas in for another year, but I think the sensible option is to put a younger driver in next to Hulkenberg. Okay. Okay. Buckle up, folks. Uh, hold on. I'm just going to get into my bunker. <laughs> Things going to explode. <laughs> all I want you to do, Matia, is to get out a piece of paper and we'll do, we'll do this together, all right? We'll do the first one together, then you'll be all right to do it yourself afterwards. So we're going to write down, we're going to put two boxes, okay? We're going to do one empty box there, one empty box there, and we're going to put experience next to one of the boxes. <laughs> we're going to put youth next to the other box. Now, I can tell you for a fact, you've got Nico Hulkenberg for next year. That's a done deal. Nico Hulkenberg has 219 race starts. If you were going to put together a grid of the most experienced drivers of all time, he'd be on it. He has the 16th most starts of all time. So I I think the guy who, when he debuted, Kimi Antonelli was three years old. I think you've got the experience box ticked. So we're going to... Matia, you ready? We're going to go and tick that box, okay? Does he know what a tick looks like? I really hope so. Um... (laughs) So we've got one driver sorted. We've got the other driver sorted. So remember, we've ticked one box. That box is the experience box, which means there's one box left to be ticked. That's the youth box. Tick it! He's going to put another tick in the other box. <laughs> <laughs> there's space for another one in here. Fuck okay. it, little one! <laughs> Go with the youth option, man. It's, uh, it's so harsh for Bottas as well, because he's had such a good season. But if you've got no intention of keeping him for 2026, why keep him for 2025? There is a good reason that 2025 is quickly becoming the year of the rookie, right? We've got Ehrman, who's going to essentially be a rookie next year. We've got um, Antonelli that will be. We've got Jack Doohan. All of these teams are putting in rookie drivers for 2025. They're not all stupid. Alpine, you know, try to prove otherwise. But they're, they're not all stupid, like they've all got a clear idea of if we give a rookie a chance in 2025, they'll be ready to go if we've got a good car ready to go in 2026. You should do the same thing. <laughs> uh, first of all, thank you, Matteo Bonotto, for being the first person in Sauber history to acknowledge that Teo Porsche actually exists. <laughs> but now you've he's already part of the family. Yeah, he is. So give him the goddamn seat. <laughs> like, he's an F2 champion. He, P- Paul Scher was asked about this and he, what could, what more could you have done, Teo? I don't know, mate, was basically his answer. <laughs> Dude won a F2 title and he's just sat there and he's been invisible for like two years. Give him the seat. Do you think, he, do you think Mateo Please. walked into the factory and then uh, Teo was just like in the corner. He's like, Who's that? And everyone goes, what? I don't How know. have you been there? Is that, that's the janitor, right? <laughs> People are sitting on his lap accidentally. Oh, didn't see you there. Sorry, mate. <laughs> Go around and hand out birthday cake. Missing him yeah. entirely. <laughs> <laughs> that meme where they're sat, stood in the corner going, they don't know an F2 driver. I don't know I'm an F2 champion. <laughs> no, we don't. Uh, yeah, I've, I've made all my points about Porsche before. Only Russell and Leclerc have won an F2 title when they've been as young as Porsche give him the seat he's pretty good is it because he sounds too much like porsche which is an audi like, like no we no, can't, we do can't that. put porsche in the car porsche I mean, <laughs> at this point i've got no better answer to that <laughs> well you mean we'll put our rival in the car god no we'll see how that goes well done to bottas who got the seat i'm sure he does right. deserve it Hang on, he does deserve, he, he bloody does he deserves a seat 
I just like if it is a straight up fight between Bottas and Porsche for Audi's future, I just think Porsche makes more sense. Yes, you are correct. But I feel so sorry for Bottas. So sorry for him. Doesn't matter because when Sebastian yeah. Vettel comes back in 2026, they're all gone. <laughs> he will drive both cars. There's another thing about that this week, right? Matia. <laughs> Sorry, if 2026 ends up being Vettel and Reichel with the <laughs> motto at the helm, I swear to God, man. <laughs> the golden years. We recreated it, boys. <laughs> We're so back. We're so back. <laughs> <laughs> they just changed the name to like Ferrari or something. Just <laughs> We're not copying, we swear. Faudi. 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 <laughs> what? All right, we're going to take our final break on this episode. On the other side, we've got a top five list coming up. Welcome back, everyone. To close out today's show, we're going to be doing a top five list. Um, We'll each give our selections five down to one, and we'd love to hear your opinions as to whether you agree with us or disagree with us on this topic. Today's topic is the top five drivers that have not won a title we're just going to use drivers from this century. So anything from 2000 onwards. Um, we'll go round with our number five picks, first of all. And we'll make our way down to number one. So number five, Sam. Who's on your list? Who's made it? I've gone for Big Rubens Barrichello at number five. The man who likes to cry. Um, and I do love old Rubens. It's just, how can you be number two to so many close you know, near misses for yourself. You go up against the Michael and then you go up against Jensen, of course, in the Braun. He was so near to so many titles. And you know what? Rubens, I think, is a bit underrated at just how good a racing driver he is. If he were to go up against many other standard drivers in that Ferrari period, and again, in that Braun, if it could have been almost so many others, I do think he'd have walked away with at least two, if not three titles under his belt. I just, there's a little part of me that feels sorry that because he comes up against arguably the greatest driver of all time in Michael Schumacher. He has this constant reputation of being a, yeah, I'm just the number two guy that happened to bring the car around because we had a good car. I just don't, I don't think that rings true. He was very, very good a lot of the time. So yeah, I think Barrichello has a rightful place on this century's men who don't have a title that maybe should have. I feel like as well with Barrichello, obviously we're looking more at the Ferrari years how good he was at Stewart in the late nineties is really undervalued. Like he, I'm allowed to include that in my argument. Oh yeah, I know. I'm just, it's, I, I think he was, he was phenomenal at that point. Um, number five for you, Harry. Uh, copy and paste. Runes Barrichello. Uh, in a, in another life, in a different alternate universe, he's, he's got at least one championship under his belt. Um, because as you say, a Ferrari, he obviously had Schumacher to go up against. And even if he was faster, he wasn't allowed to beat him. And then, uh, and then he was a, a nearly a nearly miss at, at Braun, and had that had those Honda years been better? I know obviously the Braun year was good. Um, had the Honda car been better when he made that switch out of uh, away from Ferrari? Yeah, who know, who knows what could have, those 07 and 08 Hondas were good. Uh, I think Barrichello could have could have been. I know Button would have been there too, but we saw how close it was in 09 with between two of them. So yeah, Barrichello very very close, and and as you say, Sam, flies under the radar quite a lot because he's just sort of dismissed as the number two, but he was a very good, very good driver. I very nearly had Barrichello on my list, but I gave the nod to old Valtteri Bottas, who we've just spoken about. Um, I think he somewhat suffered from post-Rosberg expectations because I think now with hindsight, we can see he did a pretty good job against Lewis Hamilton. Like he, he came within a hundred points of winning the world title twice, which I think is fairly good going. Obviously we know what he did at Williams as well, where he beat Felipe Massa three years in a row and his qualifying pace versus Hamilton was always pretty solid. Like he out qualified Hamilton between five and eight times a season um, in, in any, in every season that they were teammates, which again, you'd take that. Uh, I know a lot of teams would take that. So yeah, I think um, I think Bottas is a little bit underappreciated for what he did at, at Mercedes. Number four, Sam. Yeah, I, I'm really... I haven't made my mind up fully on my... It's, I've got the drivers, but where they sit, it's so close together. So forgive me if you sit there and go, how dare you put this driver at number four? It's that close for me. Um, I've got Daniel Ricciardo in at number four at the moment. And you might think a bit of recency bias, maybe. Um, or maybe you think opposite of recency bias. Maybe you're new to Formula One. You think, hang on a minute, Daniel Ricciardo is that old guy that drives around in a fake RB. What, what are you doing there? Well, once upon a time, that guy looked like he could be the, the big thing. 
turns up, of course, in a car that is so bad that no one even remembers what he was doing with it, and then finally gets moved to the junior program of Red Bull, and in his first year at the senior team, beats Sebastian Vettel. And not just beats him. He, 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 Sebastian, mate, there's a puzzle on the floor. We ain't got a mop. Let me flip you over and use it to mop up the rubbish, mate, because, you know, that's what I've got with you. I'm mopping the floors with you, Sebastian, four-time world champion Vettel. Um, yeah, but he was did. Vettel was just having a bit of, you know, he was oh, trying yeah, different things the car. Yeah, he was yeah, yeah, yeah. Out, I'm tired. Ferrari. I'm tired. After those. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, mate. Bloody the moron. guy's got eight victories, and on his day, good Lord, he is unbeatable. I think Ricardo might end up being, and it could be the same with a couple of other drivers on, this, on people's list and my list moving forward, that we haven't finished the careers of just yet. This, it could be a case of right driver, wrong time every time i think he may he's made bad choices i think he's come up against maybe the 0.1 percent that end up being better than him in max verstappen again in an alter- alternate universe daniel ricardo is still leading the red bull lineup and never saw his slumping form never end up had to having to recover at other teams that weren't as good and i think i think if they're in that car together daniel and max in the 2021 fight against Lewis Hamilton and, and Bottas, I think they could win both titles handedly at that point. So, um, yeah, Ricardo sits fourth on my list. I do think he's so close, so close to being a great in the sport. Copy and paste. I've got Ricardo fourth as well um, for much of the same reason. So I won't repeat them. But yeah, he was against Verstappen. The stats are very close and they were teammates for nearly three complete seasons. And I think Verstappen had like 18 more points in those three years, which spread out across that many Grand Prix is not a lot. Um, Verstappen took five wins when they were teammates together. Ricardo took four again, very close. And Ricardo had three poles. Verstappen never did in their time together as teammates. So um, and what is all often forgotten is how good he was at Renault as well. I will stand by how good he was. What, two those... podiums there? Yeah, and he was against Hulkenberg and Ocon in those two years as well. So absolutely, they weren't slouch teammates. Like he had 173 points in those two years. Hulkenberg and Ocon across the two years didn't get to 100. They had 99. So he was he was very good there as well. And I think people will look at the McLaren and obviously the Minardi years and say, how on earth can you have him that high? But for a, for a good sort of six, seven years, Ricardo was very very good which i appreciate people will ignore i'm saying this because i hate ricardo with every fiber <laughs> of my being harry number four uh, i've gone for mr chunky juan pablo montoya um again suffers in the fact that he went up against schumacher in those early noughties and uh Obviously, I know they weren't all dominant, but Schumacher, the Ferrari days were were pretty dominant for for him. So, I think again, alternate universe. There's there's maybe a championship there. 2005, if he hadn't hurt himself playing tennis. Gosh, that, you that paused there. What, tennis. Can you explain why you paused there? Did you just forget the sport? Nothing. I just was trying to remember how he hurt himself, and it was playing tennis. Tennis. <laughs> <laughs> a very common injury. Um, yeah. caused, him to, caused him to miss the first few races of the season. Uh, I know the 05 McLaren wasn't reliable anyway, but who knows, he could have been, been in that fight too. Um, he was, I mean, Ben, you are obviously a big 90s kart fan. Uh, Mr. Chunky, Juan Pablo Montoya, was an absolute demon sometimes. And put some man, even in those noughties, uh, early noughties, he put some manners on Schumacher when he was in the Ferrari that... Uh, made me cry as a child um so that uh, in itself deserves makes him makes him deserve a place on the list um he he was wickedly fast and hot-headed yes but he just entered f1 i mean his first year he almost won like the second race of the year or something like brazil wasn't it um and he gets taken out by some someone's dad (laughs) um max verstappen's dad takes him out and and ruins what could have been a pretty pretty memorable uh first win so he yeah he was he was very fast back in the day i know he lost interest in f1 in 06 um and went off to do nascar or something instead but there's you know 01 02 03 it's actually forgotten how close he came to the championship it was him and raikkonen but it was a decider yeah it was the last race of the season so he took it down to the wire um so yeah, a bit unlucky in that sense, and and again, had he been, in, I would have been so. Intri- I know he wasn't going to last because Hamilton was coming in 07 anyway. 
Uh, I'd have been intrigued to see where, if he'd stayed in F1, where he would have gone, what he would have done after leaving McLaren. Because uh, he was leaving McLaren at the end of 06 anyway. But yeah, I wonder, I wonder where he would have gone next. But anyway, that's for another time. He'd have been winning a championship in a Super Aguri, I reckon. <laughs> he was that good. He was that good. Um, and that leads quite nicely on to my number three driver, which is Juan Pablo Montoya. Um, yes, guy was very quick. Michael Schumacher, like you said, Michael Schumacher had a lot of rivals in his career, if you think. David Coulthard, I, notably. David Coulthard, if you were maybe creating a top 20, you'd include him in there. <laughs> um, <laughs> David, David Hill, Shaq Villeneuve. Um, Raikkonen, Alonso, Hacken, oh, you've there's a lot of rivals. I'm not sure anyone scared Michael Schumacher the same way that Montoya did. And, and I know it wasn't every race and it was only you know once in a, a little while, but when Montoya was on form, I, th- I think he was like right up there. Um, so like you say, he, he only comes into F1 when I think he was 25 years old. So um, he had quite a late start, in, at least into F1. But yeah, when he was on his game, there were very few that could match him. I, I would um, encourage anyone uh, to go and watch, go on YouTube, the 2004 San Marino GP, mainly for the start, and then try and find the preceding uh, press conference because Schumacher absolutely <laughs> has Montoya on the grass and then in the press conference it's like yeah I didn't see him and then Montoya's like oh yeah yeah he definitely didn't see me like proper sarcastic and it's that sort of thing like yeah they just uh, it, it riled Schumacher Montoya could rile Schumacher probably in a way that others didn't rile scare I think that's probably a fair fair, uh, fair analysis Sam who have you got at number three well, I don't want to be boring, but Mr. Chanky is a number three. I'll keep it simple. Seven wings, 30 podiums, 13 poles. 2003 was a demon year. One at Monaco, and he scared Michael Schumacher, which was, we've said, really quite difficult to do. So um, I love him, and he rightfully sits on the list. Number three for you, Harry? Uh, I've sought to do all three and four. I've put Ricardo at number three. Um, but again, I could probably put them the other way around. He... Again, kind of right, as you said, Sam, right driver, maybe slightly wrong. I think you put, Ricardo comes into the sport as in as he was maybe like three years earlier and and has that sort of progression up when he's not up against who he then ended up up against. I, th- I think it could be a different story for him. Um, say he's in one of the Red, he's in the Red Bull in 2012 or 2013 or even 2011. I just wonder what, what could have been because... Uh, Mark Webber, bless him, never really, apart from 2010, never really p- posed much of a challenge to, to, to Sebastian in those days. Um, and I do wonder what could have happened. And this isn't Ricardo's fault. I'm not saying he would have been ready in 2011 because he was in a HRT and he was a young driver, I'm just saying, in a different in a different life. Um, yeah, I do wonder. And as you say, Ben, his, his performances against Verstappen, I think, go under the radar. And if you look how, we know how good Verstappen is now. Uh, Ricardo certainly kept him honest and even beat him uh, at some statistics. So, yeah, Ricardo, um, very much back in the day, but not now. But, yeah, Ricardo's number, number three. Number two, Sam. Uh, this is definitely one I struggled with. Um, I felt like my my previous three were all really, really close and kind of earned their place where they are. But I've, I've, got, I've got Lando at number two. And I think... I think I could definitely be entirely wrong for thinking this, but he has held his own from the moment he's walked into this sport. He has gone up against some really tough individuals, most notably Carlos Sainz, so of course now Oscar Piastri, who we don't know how good he might be, and it might turn out to be actually in 10 years' time we look back at this and go, crikey, Oscar Piastri is a four-time world champion, and I know Norris really went swinging with that guy and, and was fantastic. But, you know, two wins to his name now, a couple of pole positions as well, constantly outshines the car constantly that with that almost moment in spa a couple of years ago where the williams obviously ending up being of george russell on the on the front row where he puts it into the wall in the rain the moment in russia as well where he makes the wrong tire choice and he's just an almost almost driver and i know he's not had a shot at a title and we might be doing this slightly too soon in terms of when i put him on my top five but i think this year is going to be one of many that is a almost, hopefully he converts moment for, for Lando Norris. So I'm not going to delve too much into it, but I think he's a special chap when it comes to how much ability he's got. I just hope he can actually convert on that special ability and make himself a bit of a legend. 
Harry, who's number two on your list? Um, I've put Robert Kubica. Uh, Ooh, that's a spicy shout. I like that. Bobby K. Uh, and again, this is looking more at his pre-2011 uh, form, not when he came up for Williams in uh, 2019. Uh, honestly, I think Kubica could have won multiple championships. I, I Mario Tyson has so much to answer for, for cancelling the direction of the 08 BMW for the 09 one, you moron. Um, <laughs> because I think that, I think when he wins in Canada that year, he's leading the championship. I think there might be, are they leading both championships by that point? I don't know, but Kubitz is... might be, it's, it's close. Kubitz is certainly leading the drivers' championship in 2008, which we all know Hamilton won that. It was Hamilton versus Massa in the end. But to think by Canada, Kubitz is in that title fight um, is it's bonkers. Season at that point. Yeah, it's bonkers. Um, so I think he could have won that one. I think if BMW don't pull out at the end of 09, who knows what happens there because, you know, he would have had to scramble for a drive at Renault. I think he ends up at Ferrari at some point. I th- it's, a, it's an entirely, and obviously then he has his terrible accident. It's an entirely different trajectory. But I, honestly, I think he, there. Are, I think you ask like the likes of Hamilton and, and Vettel and co, and they, he was, he was the man. Kibitza was the man, but just sort of went under the radar a bit because he never really he only picked up that one win and it never really happened for him. So I think Kibitza probably won't be recognised by, by many just because of his 2019, his 2019 uh, performances. But, I, you know, we can't really blame him too much on that, uh, to be honest. And fairytale ending, he did win a race for Ferrari the other day in WEC. It's excellent. That he did. He's uh, so good, isn't he? Bless him. Um, but yeah, honestly, I think Kibitza, could, he could be multiple world champion uh, in those late noughties, early teens, and it just never happened. Quick question about Kubica, because you focused on like 2008 and what really should have happened in 2009. Potentially massive, controversial opinion. 2010. Was he the best driver on the grid in 2010? Oh, that's a valid, valid point. That Renault was not good, and he made it look amazing. Yeah. Like most, of the, there was some rate like Spa and Monaco that year. He should not have been anywhere near Red Bulls and Ferraris and McLarens and co. And he was just dragging it. There's a great, there's some great, um, it's probably on YouTube, but great onboard in Singapore. He has to pit and then overtake to get to back where he started. And if he had a puncture or something, but he just absolutely minces through the field. Yeah, it's a good shout. I think what always saddened me about Kubica, which you spoke about, if he, you know, if he doesn't leave, F1 doesn't have his accident. The trajectory of his career is so difficult to see where he does pick up a title. You know, like Ferrari, would he Would he even get his top ability beating I mean, a Red Bull? Alonso couldn't. So yeah, it's a difficult yeah, you know, one. Because I do put them on a pretty, you know, as much as Kibitzing ever turned it into titles, I would say on raw ability, they're pretty similar. After that point, he probably stays at Ferrari. I can't see him going to Mercedes unless maybe they don't pick up Lewis Hamilton instead, which feels unlikely. Um, maybe they don't pick up Rosberg who was already there I don't know but yeah it just feels convoluted it's a shame because it's a great shout and someone actually I think I overlooked but it's, it's, a, it's a good shout uh, number two on my list I've gone for Felipe Massa and I was unsure on where to put Felipe Massa because he is without a doubt like the closest driver to ever win a world championship that will appear on this list um, and it depends on how much you look at Massa pre-injury and post-injury. And I think I've sort of come round on this on the last couple of years because I used to be, I don't know, I think I used to undervalue Massa a little bit because of the way he was obliterated by Alonso and obviously Bottas beat him quite comfortably at Williams. Realistically, was he ever the same driver again after Hungary in 09? And I, I, I'm not sure he was. but Because before that, he was very competitive. Um, he was... He was closer to beating Schumacher than Barrichello was, um, which I think he deserves a bit of credit for. He was, you know, 07 and 08, obviously he he gets very close in 08. 07, he should have been, or maybe could have been in the fight with Raikkonen, but he wasn't that far off at the same time. He got more pole positions than, than Raikkonen did in their time together. And he beats Raikkonen quite handily in 2008. So um, again, it very much depends on how you split up Massa's career, but I I'm choosing to look at what happened pre-injury, and he was he was very good pre-injury, which leads us nicely on to our number one driver not to win a title this century. Harry Eid, who've you got? Um, firstly, honourable shout out to 
to David Coulthard because he's not named the top five. He's probably number six. Uh, but Agreed. He is take, uh, the yes. driver with or after before Sterling Moss. Um, he has the most wins without a title. So big shout out to DC. Just not going my top five. I put Charles Leclerc. That's my number one because he we we joke about God Leclerc, but that boy has some God given talent in a race car. And we said it many times, free Leclerc, but it's being squandered by the terribleness of Ferrari sometimes. Monza and Monaco this year aside. Um, again, Leclerc, I know that he has, he, he, you know, he's made some mistakes himself, but to be honest, I think it's only because he's trying to make up for the faults of a, of the team he's driving for. I, I, I think Leclerc in a better car in 22 wins the title. Um, obviously 2023, he wasn't anywhere near, but that was not his fault. The car was terrible. And again, this year, I think he's having one of, if not one of his best years ever. He just doesn't have the car. To, <laughs> he doesn't have the car all the time to show it. When he does have the car to show it, Monza, Monaco, you can't see him for dust. But uh, he's just not getting that opportunity all the time. So it's uh, it's obviously not over yet. As a the Klaxons, another reference to the Klaxons. Two in two. <laughs> They're bringing them back. <laughs> um, hey, they never left. Uh, but <laughs> thanks, Daniel. <laughs> but. Um, yeah, it's still time for Leclerc, but currently as it stands, I think he's he's number one because there's a special in the same way that Verstappen is a once in a generational talent. I think we've got two on our hands with Verstappen and Leclerc, and it's an absolute travesty that he's not in a title fight currently. Sam, who's number one on your list? I think it just shows how good he is because Charles Leclerc is number one on my list. And the names we've run through already in this, you know, you think of the likes of Massa, who missed out by one race, David Coulthard, who wasn't on any of our, well, he might be on, on Ben's list, but, you know, he's, he's, he's not, not on any of our, okay. <laughs> <laughs> good. He, he statistically should be on the list because he is so, so good. You know, Daniel Ricciardo, who has been historically brilliant. I put Lando Norris in there. Well, I'm proud of him on toy, but Leclerc, for two of us currently, sits at the top. And he is arguably never, ever had the best car at any point. Um, there's been some close calls, but never had the best car at any point. And his statistics are incredible. In 141 entries, the King has picked up 38 podiums. That's like one podium in every four Grand Prix. I think in that car, because I remember he did a season in, in Sauber, that's pretty special. Pole positions, he's had 25 poles. That's under one in six races he gets pole position. But it tells you that the car isn't there because he's only won seven. And I'm terrified that because he spends his whole career at Ferrari, who haven't seen success for 17 years now, he might just slowly rot away in a place where he's not able to materialize his absolute brilliance that he has. He is a sensational talent. He is generational. And he has come up against some of the most ridiculously talented people coming through the ranks in the likes of Max Verstappen, of course, but George Russell, Lando Norris as well, Oscar Piastri's hot on his heels. There's so many brilliant drivers right now in this golden era of young drivers. And with a name like Charles Marc Hervé Percival Leclerc, <laughs> you can't sit at the very top of the list. Percival, I forgot about that. Oh, yeah. he's, he's amazing. He deserves to be number one. Um, I will, before I give David Coulthard my number one spot, I, I will <laughs> quickly say, um, uh, Carlos Sainz wasn't far off being number five on my list. Um, I think given the standard of teammate he's come across since, you know, he entered the sport, he's done a very good job, um, but he didn't quite make my list. All aboard the Leclerc bandwagon. Here we go. Yeah, he's number one for me as well. Um, I'll quick fire his career, but he had a great year one at Salva. It's actually underrated how good he was in that first year at Sauber. 2019, beat Sebastian Vettel, gets seven poles that season. Vettel only gets two. 2020, that Ferrari is a pile of poo. He scores 98 points. Vettel scores 33. 2021, um, you know, that's the only year, 2021, that he was beaten by a teammate in Carlos Sainz. It was very close. Um, 2022 and 23, obviously, he kicks on again. Um Pole positions, he has 25 pole positions. His teammates combined have seven. Like, that's pretty good going. Um, and if you want his overall qualifying record against teammates, he's out-qualified teammates 96 times, and teammates have out-qualified him 44 times. That's, again, a very good record, given 
Vettel signs. He's had good teammates. So, um, yeah, Leclerc is top for me as well. Statistically, Heike Kovalainen and rolling in his Formula 1 grave right now. Must be gutting, must be included. Yeah. I mean, Jano Trulli was very close as well. but Understandably. You know. There we go. So, um, Sam, you had Leclerc followed by Norris, then Montoya, Ricardo, and Barrichello. Harry had uh, Leclerc, then Kubica, then Ricardo, Montoya, Barrichello. And I had Leclerc, Massa, Montoya, Ricardo, Bottas. Lovely. Good. I would like to know from everyone listening who had the best list and what would your list look like? And I'll do it for this episode, I reckon. Sam, got anything else to say? Uh, no, but thank you for listening to the podcast that nearly won titles of best podcast. I'm sure that'll be us in 20 years' time when people run through it. Just feels that way, doesn't it? Um, late, oh, we just feel like a Barrichello more than a Michael Schumacher. Cry yeah, a lot. Fair. Thanks for listening, folks. <laughs> uh, Patreon. Lot. <laughs> Thanks for it's available. Uh, links in the description if you want loads of extra content. We're going to be together in a couple of weeks' time, so you'll be getting even better the likes of beer we're breaking as well. Um, we're always a lot more fun when we sit in the same room, so make sure you sign up for that. Don't miss the silliness, because we'll be doing a little bit of coat of planning, coat of discussion, because, of course, it's, it's the countdown is on. We're almost there. Um, we're definitely not excited. Uh, Discord's available. You can join that as well, and you should, because come midweek when we do our Baku preview we'll need your submissions um and the same for the review as well make sure you follow us on social media late breaking f1 our numbers have been pumping through the roof thank you charlotte claire for that we've uh, been rolling in the followers recently but it could be you you could join us um if you haven't already get aboard come say hello this is recording for youtube late breaking f1 as well uh thanks for listening even on the long race weekends we do appreciate you in the meantime i've been samuel sage i've been ben hocking and i've been harry Eid. and remember keep breaking late